Okay, so uh, you see now we have seen almost uh, all the key uh, components that you will see in most of the um, classical as well as the, as, as, well as, the, as, well as the advanced uh, scene in architectures, right? So um, again, the key concept is convolution, which is a feature extraction, then the activation function, then fully connected layers and the end-to-end -end learning which helps you learn the filters as well as uh, the weights for the classification layer, right? So if you remember, we were saying uh, in, the, in the discussion that we have had on a topic that we call transfer learning, that when you have to solve a problem, right? So it is not a smart idea that everyone starts making their own network from the scratch, right? For example, if you make a network for recognizing faces and I make a network, then uh, more or less uh, our architectures would be similar, except for the fact that maybe you are using four layers, I'm using five layer, your filter size is three by three, my filter size is five by five and so on, right? So basically these are hyperparameters. The general idea would stay in the same that you will be stacking uh, C convolutional and maybe activation layers followed by fully connected layers, right? So. Generally, what people do is that when they have a problem to solve, first they see if some of the existing model can solve their problem. And there are many models which have been made publicly available. And those models have been trained on millions of images, right? Most of them are in, on ImageNet, but recently you will find some other models which are trained on some specialized data like um, sketches or something similar, right? But most of the models uh, that you would find they are trained on the ImageNet data set, right? So uh, what we can do, we can download those models, right? Uh, and we can actually reuse them using either fine tuning or feature extraction, and then we can solve our own problem, right? But you see, it is also important to understand at least to some extent the architecture of these models. And why is it important? Because um, not only you will know the details of a particular architecture or a model, but it will also help you if you, if you try to develop your own model, right? For example, if some of the existing models is not working on your problem, your data set is very different from what, what is available already uh, pre-trained on some other data set, and you want to develop your own model. So what are the different options available to you? other than convolution, pooling, and these batch normalization dropout. So if, if you have, to some extent, in-depth knowledge of existing architectures, it will help you build a better architecture for your own model, right? So it serves two purposes. So within this uh, context, uh, we'll try and study some of the popular uh, architectures which have been made available by the research community. All of these can be downloaded from GitHub or many, many other sources, right? So we'll start our discussion uh, with uh, how CNNs have changed traditional computer vision, which we also discussed in our preliminary uh, sessions. Then the main themes are that we'll, we'll be studying uh, with some level of detail, some popular architecture, starting with Linet, AlexNet, and VJG, right? AlexNet, you have already seen to some extent when we study transfer learning, right? So the first three bullets that you see, uh, today maybe you will consider them like classical CNN architectures, right? Because um, although they are not very old, uh, but still like VGG 2014, and, uh, but still uh, when, you when you see the advanced architectures today, so maybe AlexNet and VGG in 2021, they are more of classical CNNs rather than something that, um, that, 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 that has many advanced features, right? On the other hand, the last three that we'll try and see, the Inception family by Google, the ResNet and uh, the DenseNet, right? These are relatively advanced, okay? Of course, you have much more advanced as well, but if you understand these, then it covers most of the key concepts which are involved in designing uh, a CNN. So uh, before we see any architecture, just uh, some general discussion that as we have been saying that if you are trying to solve uh, uh, image recognition problem using traditional computer vision, so the pipeline is pre-processing, 
if it is required. And then the key modules are extraction of features and classification, right? In this case, um, basically, uh, by looking um, at what problem is to be solved, you will you can seek help from a domain expert, and they can tell you what are the good features that you should try for this problem, right? So some of the common computer vision features, maybe you have heard their names, HOG, SAVE, TELBP. Even if you have not heard their names, it's okay, right? You can think A, B, C, X, Y, Z. These are some features, okay? So you can actually compute these features and then train a classifier like SVM or random forest GC entries and recognize the object, right? So the important point in this discussion is that here, the feature extraction is unsupervised. Now, what does it mean unsupervised? When you are extracting features, you are not looking at the class label, okay? For example, if I say that, okay, apply Sobel filter or, or extract horizontal edges from an image. Now, who told me this information that horizontal edges can be useful? Maybe based on my experience or intuition, I thought that, okay, for this problem, this could be a good feature, but I'm not adapting my feature by looking at data. It means I'm not changing my features by looking at the class labels, right? So that's why we use this terminology that without looking at the class labels, you extract the same feature from the complete data set. There is no, you can say adaptation of filters or features. You just say, okay, extract say hog, then you simply extract hog from every image and then you map every image to a feature vector and then you feed this feature vector to a classifier, right? So that's why we are calling it unsupervised, okay? The second and more important problem is that in many discussions we have been looking at that how human brain actually tries to recognize objects, right? So you see this unsupervised feature learning is very different from the working of a human brain. If you remember the experiments of Hubel and Wiesel on, on the brain of a cat, so there were parts of brain which activated when the cat was exposed to um, edges at certain orientations, right? And then those basic primitive shapes were combined to more high level information in the subsequent parts of the brain, right? So you see, if you talk of deep learning, uh, so it is, it is actually closer to the working of a human brain as compared to unsupervised learning, right? Where you say, for example, if you look at an object, you do not compute some fixed hard coded features, right? You, you holistically recognize it. Right, through that sequence, which we have already discussed, right? So this is the core concept of uh, CNN, which is automatic feature learning, that the feature extraction is also supervised. It means by looking at your data, you actually decide that which, which features are good for this particular problem. And you also have the class label information in extracting those features, right? And I think this also we had discussed maybe with a different slide that Okay, um, why, why we can't do it with fully connected neural network? Because if you, you are using a fully connected architecture, then every neuron or every pixel in the image is connected to every neuron in the next layer. So the number of parameters would explode. You will have a uh, number of connections which will not be possible to manage, right? You will run out of memory maybe, right? But in case of a CNN, since you have a local connectivity means you are applying the filter and the same filter is applied across the complete image. So that's why you have very uh, few parameters as compared to what you have in a fully connected network, right? So, uh, so far, if you, if some of the initial CNNs you will see, um, all will have more or less similar pattern. And what is that pattern? They will feed the image they will have convolution, activation function, and pooling. So, and this block will be repeated maybe k times, right? Or maybe uh, convolution is repeated sometimes and then there's a pooling. And eventually you will have feature map which you will feed to the sensor and classification. So this is um, in the initial, uh, you can say architectures, this was the common pattern, right? But with time, people actually uh, started to add more sophisticated layers in their architectures, in their models to maybe, for example, to reduce overfitting or to speed up training and to actually learn more effective features, right? So what are all those? We'll, we'll, we'll see that in a while.
Okay, so now we'll be uh, actually uh, moving to, uh, to, you can say the last uh, session in which we'll be discussing uh, some of the architectures. And for today, I'll be just discussing these first three. Okay, so because we already had a pretty heavy session. So hopefully for today, we'll be uh, looking at these uh, first three and then we move ahead. Right, we will be stopping with that one. Okay, so we start with this first one, which is LeanNet. And uh, you must be wondering that whenever we talk of uh, CNNs, mostly we say 2012, and mostly we talk of LXNet, right? In almost uh, all the books or literature or other, you can say stuff, you will be. Uh, uh, looking at this uh, AlexNet, which is 2012, right? But actually, the uh, you can say the the first or one of the pioneer architectures it was proposed in uh, 1998. So we'll be looking at some some details of this. Okay, so uh, basically, there were many uh, efforts to develop CNN earlier than 2012. And one of the notable efforts was in 1998, where a CNN very similar to what we see today was proposed to solve the digit recognition problem, right? And it is the same digit recognition problem that we that you are attempting in your assignments, right? That uh, the, the the key motivation was basically the postal service. That at that point in time, they wanted to automate the postal service. Uh, because you must be knowing that on the on the letters there is always a zip code like uh, some zip code a five digit or a six digit zip code. If you know the zip code, you know the uh, city or the town, right? So they, they they could be automatically sorted. So this digit recognition actually uh, the, the problem actually emerged from that application area. So in in this uh, architecture, uh, there were convolutional layers, pooling layers, just like we see today, but uh, a key difference was that today, mostly we use max pooling, right? But in this architecture, as I told you that in the earlier architectures, it was common to use average pooling, right? That rather than picking the max value, they would just simply take the average of four or eight values and replace it for downsampling purposes. The total number of parameters in this architecture was 60,000, which is quite less, right? If you compare it, with some of the modern architecture, which have like millions of parameters, as you will see shortly. So this 60,000 is not a very big number in, in comparison to uh, what you will see shortly, right? The complete paper of uh, this architecture is available, gradient-based learning approach. So if you, if you are interested, you can actually uh, see more details uh, from this paper. And this is actually the, you can say a small demo, which is available online that um, how, it is uh, reading uh, digits and giving you the output, right? So you see, uh, basically the focus of the digit is changing. You can assume that the paper or the camera is being moved. Uh, sometimes you see three digits, sometimes you see them at different scales, sometimes you only see two digits. And uh, at the top, uh, you have the answer, which is actually the final uh, recognized digit string, right? Sometimes it gives you 384, 84, depending upon how close the camera is to the uh, image. Okay, so you see it was in 1998, but what about what happened between 1998 and 2012? It is like 14 years, right? So why this one did not gain popularity? The reason was that if we go back here, there were multiple reasons. The first reason was that it was solving a digit recognition problem, which uh, you see, which was even at that point in time, it was not that challenging because you, you are solving a 10 class problem and other methods which were not using convolutional, uh, you can say the idea of convolution, they were also getting acceptable performance, right? So if you come up with a novel method which does not um, give you a dramatic increase in the performance, then maybe people would not notice it that much, right? So this was one reason that it was not applied to a very challenging problem. The other reason, which was actually the main reason was that you see, this was a very small architecture, only 60,000 parameters. So with the hardware that was available in 1998, uh, this, this could be trained, right? But 
if you even slightly increase it, then the number of parameters would go uh, very, you can say very, the number would increase very much. And at that point in time, you neither had hardware resources nor large data sets to train such networks, right? So this was another reason that you see a big gap that from like 1998 to 2012, you, you don't see much of, uh, you can say any breakthrough uh, from the perspective of CNN, right? So this was the main reason, but the important point is that although we uh, mostly we say that CNNs um, are thanks to AlexNet, but actually uh, it was 14 years back and even before 1998, there were some efforts. They, they did not become much popular. So the one that gained popularity was the Leanet in 1998, right? So um, in, 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 some, in some of the literature, you will find this uh, Leanet as being the pioneer CNN, right? Although AlexNet is uh, said pioneer in the true sense because this is where everyone actually shifted to uh, CNNs, right? So in the previous week, we discussed AlexNet. Um, so you see, this was the person behind this. And you see, when I taught this course for the first time, so I just searched that, okay, how many articles have cited this paper? So it, this number was around 34,000, which is a very huge number. And I did it today, right? 6th of April, just before your lecture. And now you see the total number of citations is like 80,000. Like this is a very, very huge number. If you understand from your RM course that getting a citation is something very challenging. And 80,000 citations, um, I mean, it's, it's something very huge. And the, this is actually telling you that uh, you see everyone who is using CNN, he cannot write a paper without citing this, right? Because whenever you are using CNN, you, will, you, you are doing some literature review, you are talking about CNN. So you will be actually referring to this paper, right? So this, this huge number of citations is actually telling you that uh, it is also telling you that more and more people are actually using uh, CNNs and that's why you see an exponential increase in the number of citations of this paper, okay? So if, uh, if you are interested, uh, you can go through this paper. It is uh, freely available, right? But this, this paper is not very easy to follow, right? If you are a beginner, uh, you don't have some hands-on experience on deep learning, then maybe this is not the best paper to start with. But I'll show you in, in the next one. So uh, if, if you want to read actually some classical paper that how people started developing CNNs, then maybe this should not be your first choice, right? Because it is it is a bit hard to follow. So but still, if, if you have some prior experience with deep learning, then you can go through different sections of this paper to understand the low level details as well, right? So uh, coming back to, uh, AlexNet, so you see this architecture is quite similar to Linet, but this model is large or deeper, right? There you had um, very fewer parameters. And as I'll show you in the next slide, it, it is deeper. And the number of parameters is much more as compared to uh, the, 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 the Linet architecture, right? So now since you have seen the basic building blocks, um, filters and pooling, so this diagram will make sense to you, right? The input to this uh, model is two to seven by two to seven by three, right? And why this size? Most of the architecture that you will see, you will see the same size, right? Because all of these models, they are trained on ImageNet, which are colored images with 1000 classes, right? And all of the image images, they, they, they are resized to a square, which means same number of rows, same number of columns, right? So most of the architectures that you will see, you will see the same size two to seven by two to seven by three, right? So as we discussed um, that this uh, network has an unusually large filter size like 11 by 11 with a stride of four, which is very unusual. You will not see such a big filter size in the modern architectures, right? Uh, but you see using a big filter size and a stride of four, it has an advantage as well that suddenly thanks to stride of four, you have reduced the spatial dimension by a factor of four, that from two to seven, you, you come to down to around 50 cross 50, right? And then you have pooling and um, a sequence of, uh, you can say convolutional layer. And eventually you see here you have, this is your final layer because we have 1000 classes, right? But these layers are also important. This number 4096, right? Why is it important? Because many of the researchers or students, when they, uh, write their first program using transfer learning, 
they start with AlexNet, right? Because this is not very heavy as compared to some of the modern architecture. So normally the first uh, program that students would make, or researchers would try with, uh, you can say transfer learning, they would do it with AlexNet. And if you remember, we said that if you want to use AlexNet as a feature extractor for your own problem, what you can do, you can actually throw away this last layer, okay? And you, you, you just pick the network till this point. Now you pass all of your data through this network. Of course, first you will resize your data to this size so that it matches uh, what is expected at the input layer. Whatever images you have, you resize them to this size, you make a forward pass. So when you pass an image, eventually you will get a vector of 4096, right? So you will have a vector of 4096 for every image in your data set. So you will map your complete data set to feature vectors and then you can use any classifier like SVM or decision tree or anything on those features, right? So uh, this 4096 is actually the dimension of the feature vector if you are using a pre-trained AlexNet for your own problem, right? Some of the other networks that we'll see, they also use uh, this number 4096, right? There's no specific reason for it, right? There's just hyperparameters that how many uh, neurons you will have in this layer. But since the next layer is 1000 neurons, so maybe just, just a proportion which suggested that it should have uh, this much size. Right? Okay, so if you remember LinNet, it had only 60,000 parameters, but in AlexNet, you see it has 60 million parameters, right? Which is, which seems a very huge number, but when you will see the next uh, few architectures, then this 60 million uh, would not sound uh, a very uh, large number, right? Okay, so uh, AlexNet uh, today, as I told you, um, it is considered a classical architecture, but still it had some innovations, right? For example, uh, it was the first, model that employed or suggested ReLU activation function rather than sigmoid or 10H, right? Previously, in all the attempts, people were using sigmoid or 10H function. So this uh, architecture for the first time employed the ReLU activation function, which allowed the networks to be trained much faster. A second important contribution of this network was dropout, right? That is the idea of dropout, uh, which we studied reduce overfitting, it was introduced uh, in this, uh, you can say, uh, architecture where in these layers, some of the neurons were randomly dropped with a probability P at training time, right? So that uh, your model is not too much dependent on a specific set of neurons and you can avoid overfitting, right? So that key, uh, you can say the key points of, uh, other than convolution, of course, the key points are um, the ReLU activation function, which was introduced and the use of dropout uh, at training, right? Okay, so the third one and the last one for today is VGG, right? Okay, many um, students who are doing thesis, they actually use VGG um, even today, but when they're giving their final presentation, the examiner asked them in Viva, what does VGG stand for, right? And unfortunately, many of the students uh, are not able to answer this question, right? So uh, please, uh, if this is the case with you, maybe if you are using it, then at least um, I would appreciate if you do uh, ha have an in-depth understanding, not only of the architecture, but you should also know that why we call it VGG. So VGG is actually a research uh, group at University of Oxford, England, right? So VGG is actually Visual Geometry Group, right? So V coming from visual, G from geometry, and then again, G from uh, group. So this is a um, research group, a very famous research group at the University of Oxford. So they actually designed um, or trained a number of uh, architectures and two of those architectures they made publicly available, right? Of course they had trained many, but two of them were made publicly available and they are commonly known as VGG16 and VGG19. There were others, but they are, they are not publicly available. Now, the 16 and 19, you can guess. VGG16 means it has 16 layers. 19 means this is the 19 layer network, right? A little deeper than the 16 layer version. So at the time they were introduced, 
in 2014. So they were considered very, very deep. And again, just like I, I showed you an analysis for LXNet, right? When I taught this course for the first time, so at that point in time, the number of citations was nearly 20,000, right? Today, in less than two years, you see uh, this paper is like uh, 55,000 citations. Again, not as much as LXNet, right? But still uh, 55,000, which is a very uh, large number of citations, okay? So this is the paper of, uh, you can say, uh, which describes in detail the architecture. Again, as I told you, uh, if you are interested in reading the details, then this is a better paper to start with. By better, it does not mean technically, but uh, when you read it, you will understand it more as compared to if you try to read the paper on LXNet, right? So if, if, if ever you get a chance, uh, you want to uh, see the details, then you can start with this paper because it is well-written and it is easy to follow. Okay, so as I told you, it was introduced in 2014. And at that point in time, it was considered very deep, right? And even if you see the title of this paper, so the title is very deep, right? Because it was deeper as compared to LXNet. Uh, but today, um, maybe 16 layers you don't consider that deep, right? But of course, in 2014, it was uh, quite a deep level. Right? So this is the architecture, uh, rather than uh, you see, we're discussing it, um, you, 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 of course, you don't need to memorize the architectures of different uh, models. But the important thing with this is that unlike LXNet, which was using very large kernel sizes, and sometimes 11 by 11, then 5 by 5, then 3 by 3, right? So VGG has a very uh, uniform and very homogeneous architecture, right? That in, in all the layers, it is using three by three filters, all the layers, right? Not like LXNet where you have first 11 by 11, then five by five, and then three by three, right? Um, all the layers have three by three filters with a stride of one, okay? And with padding. So it means uh, they are doing padding and uh, they are using uh, same filter size. Similarly, when they do pooling, in all the pooling, they use two by two with a stride of two, okay? So you see, it's it's fairly simplified. And if you remember, if you are doing pooling with this these settings, what it does, it actually reduces your spatial dimensions by a factor of two. Right? It means it will, if your image is hundred by hundred, after one pooling, it will become fifty by fifty, then twenty five by twenty five, and so on. Right? Now with this information, if you come back here, so now you see there's a very regular and homogeneous downsampling. You start with 224 by 224, right? Since you are doing uh, pooling always with the same setting, so every time you will make it half. It will become 112, then it will become 56 cross 56, then 28 cross 28, and then 14 cross 14. So you see, you are downsampling always by the same factor, and that factor is a factor of two, right? You are reducing by half. And as we all know, once we go deeper in a network, generally, spatial dimensions reduce and depth increases. You see, um, uh, three depth is three because you have a colored image, then 64 filters, 128, 256, 512, 512. So depth is almost doubling in all the layers, except this one where they, they kept the depth uh, to 512, right? So eventually, Finally, you have this volume, which is seven cross seven cross five one two. Okay. When I showed you the implementation of transfer learning with VJG, right? If you remember, we discussed this number seven by seven by five one two because when you throw away the fully connected layer, these are the fully connected layer. You say, okay, I want to use VJG as a feature extractor. I will only use the convolutional part, not the fully connected layer. So if you remember uh, this number, we said when you will pass an image through VJG network, you will get something which is seven cross seven cross five. And now you can actually verify that why it was so, because now you have the complete details, the architectural details of VJG network, okay? Now today, suppose if I ask you that, okay, I show you this diagram and I ask you, okay, implement this network in TensorFlow. 
So you see, it's fairly simple. You just have a compact representation of this. And for each layer, you can just add the corresponding layer in TensorFlow, right? I'll show you on the next slide. So before I show you the architecture, as I told you that the LXNet, it had only 60 million parameters, which sounded very huge. Now this VJG, it has 138 million parameters, right? Which is almost, um, which, is, which is even more than double the parameters of uh, LXNet, right? So some of the uh, subsequent, uh, you can say architectures that we'll see, uh, they will make an attempt to reduce this number of parameters, right? Because as people were making deeper and deeper networks, uh, the number of parameters was exploding, which makes sense, right? So what you will see next week, um, uh, we'll see some efforts where researchers tried that they can make deeper network but the number of parameters should remain manageable, right? Anyways, so this is the detailed architecture where you have um, two convolutional layers, then pooling. You know that all the convolutions are three by three, then again, two convolutions pooling, then three convolutions pooling and so on. Eventually you have fully connected layer and finally you have the output layer, which has 1000 neurons, right? Now you see, it's fairly simple. If you want to implement it, we know um, the, the, we have convolution three by three filter, okay? And 64 such filters. Then again, three by three filters, 64 such filters, and then you have pooling with a window of two, two, and a stride of two, okay? And then again, you have convolution. So you notice the important point that all the convolutions are actually three by three convolutions. And all the pooling layers have exactly the same settings, okay? Stride of two and a window of two cross two. So that's why once you uh, actually um, have this architecture, it's, it's very easy to, to recall because you have exactly the same settings in all the layers, right? And eventually we have uh, these fully connected layers with 4096, 4096 layer and 1000 layers. So you see this part is exactly the same as you had in the helix net, 4096, 4096 and 1000, right? So if you, if you write this, so for one layer, you have one statement, right? And you can actually um, do model dot summary, which will tell you the output at each layer and the number of parameters at each layer. And then you can add them together and sum them to find the total number of parameters in this network, just like you always do. Right? But of course, if you have to use VJG today in transfer learning, then you will not make this architecture from the scratch because if you do so, it means that uh, you are actually uh, training this model from the scratch. So as uh, we discussed in, the implementation section in the previous week, um, almost all the libraries support directly importing the models, right? For example, from TensorFlow or Keras, you can directly import LXNet or VGG16 or VGG19, right? So for the first time, when you run this program, it will take some time because it will download the model, not only the architecture, but also the weights, right? Which will be like you know, quite heavy in terms of um, the, the space requirements, right? Once it is downloaded, then it will be stored on your disk. So if subsequently you run the program, then it will not take much time because it will simply load the model from your disk, right? You can simply um, import these models in TensorFlow and just uh, write uh, VGG16 or VGG19 dot summary, and it will print the complete summary of that model. So you can verify uh, whatever we have seen in the lecture that, okay, what is the architecture? What is input at each layer? What is output at each layer? And what is the number of parameters, right? So with that, we'll uh, stop for today, but uh, just um, building up for the next week. In the next week, we'll be starting uh, with modern, relatively modern architecture, and we'll be spending um, some, some good amount of time on the inception family, which is a family of, um, deep neural networks, uh, more specifically deep convolutional neural networks by Google. So these are um, these are very commonly used. So if you are doing some research today, it is highly likely that rather than LXNet or VJG, maybe you will be tempted to use one of the inception models or ResNet maybe, right? So that we'll see in the next week, right? So with that, I'll stop.